We'll start this morning with the coronavirus and the worst day yet for new cases. The World Health Organization reported 106,000 on Tuesday alone. That, by the way, is the uh, single biggest day since the outbreak began. Nearly half of those cases, 45,000 right here in the United States. In the meantime, the total number of cases in the world has now topped 5 million. And take a look at this map. It shows just how wide the virus is. It is on every continent now, except Antarctica. And the CDC has updated its guidance on the virus, saying it is not easily spread from surfaces or objects like packages or groceries. They say it mainly spreads through person-to-person -person contact. We're going to talk to Dr. Torres about that in just a moment, but let's start off with NBC's Sam Brock. Hey, Sam, good morning. Hoda Savannah, good morning. It is high school graduation season right now. Students at Coral Gables High School were expecting to graduate in just a couple days. Instead, though, it's going to be a virtual ceremony on June the 9th. From graduations to church services, states right now lifting their ban on large gatherings as a battle is currently brewing between the CDC and the federal government over guidelines. Overnight, a senior administration official confirms to NBC News that guidance for reopening houses of worship has been put on hold. After a battle between the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the White House, the senior administration official telling NBC News that sometimes the CDC's recommendations can be overly bureaucratic, so we're doing our best to rein in the CDC and empower states to make their own decisions. The back and forth coming amid news a churchgoer in Butte County, California, recently tested positive for coronavirus, potentially exposing 180 worshipers, renewing warnings on large social gatherings and highlighting a growing struggle between the CDC and the White House over reopening guidelines. The CDC quietly releasing a detailed roadmap this week, including details on child care facilities, restaurants, summer camps, and youth sports organizations, as well as new guidelines on touching contaminated surfaces, saying there's still a risk, but that the disease does not spread easily in that manner. You are now graduates of Thompson High School. As for graduations, scenes of pomp, and strange circumstances across Alabama. Wyatt William Francis. Where Wednesday night, 400 seniors in Hoover collected their diplomas at an 11,000 seat stadium. There are a lot of safety concerns, but I'm trying to stay as safe as I can, even in the midst of the issue. Where students were given four tickets each and all attendees told no mask, no entry. Tonight, 650 more students will graduate in person at the same venue though not without some protest. Push it back a couple months. Can you hold a graduation with social distancing safely? In my opinion, not at this time, and especially in the case of Alabama, not at this time in this state, with cases rising fairly dramatically just in the last two to three weeks. Alabama's school superintendent issued guidance earlier this month that says at a minimum, Gatherings must be held in a facility that would allow a distance of six feet between households. Family members of the same household may sit together without regard to the social distance rule. And it's not just Alabama. Wow, <laughs> what a senior year. In Texas, ceremonies on the gridiron. <laughs> in Norman, Oklahoma, a packed activity center. Students shoulder to shoulder with the city manager's blessing and few visible masks. Sites that signal a new appetite for risk as Americans try to turn the corner on COVID. In Montgomery, Alabama this morning, where the health care system is strained and hospitalizations are up, a stark warning from the mayor there who says that if you are in Montgomery and you need an ICU bed, you're in trouble. And Savannah Hoda, those graduations we were just showing you about an hour from Montgomery. Back to you. All right, Sam, thank you. Let's turn to NBC's medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres, good morning to you. Uh, I'm sure you were disturbed as many were to see what the WHO said, that it had its single worst day of new cases. New cases, I mean, that's going in the opposite direction to state the obvious. What do you make of it? 
And Savannah, what I make of it is that the things we're putting in place to work are working appropriately well, but we also know at the same time that we are going to have upticks in cases. And we're seeing some of those photos that Sam Brock had out there of people in graduation shoulder to shoulder here in the U.S., that's a little disconcerting because at the same time you realize that they're not taking as seriously as they should the fact that this is a disease that's still there, it's still spreading throughout the country. And now that we're opening up the country a little bit more, people really need to concentrate on doing that social distancing where wearing masks, doing those things we know they need to do to stay safe because we can't let our guard down yet. I know it's been a few months. I know a lot of people are tired of doing things, but at the same time, we can't let our guard down because we're going to be right back where we started from, and then we're going to have to do this all over again. Let's talk about this new guidance from the CDC that says that the virus does not spread that easily from contaminated surfaces. People who've been wiping off each and every grocery and their packages would love to stop doing that. Is that what this means? I think what it means is that we can go ahead and not be as concerned about that. We still need to be a little bit concerned and still need to do the things we need to do to stay safe. And that means mainly washing our hands. So focusing more on washing our hands than on taking care of every container we have there, washing every piece of fruit or vegetable, because now what the CDC is saying, which research bears out, that it's not as spread easily through contact. In other words, we don't touch something and touch our faces and get it as easily, although we can still get it that way. The main focus needs to be on that social distancing, wearing masks, because getting it through respiratory droplets in our eyes and our nose is the number one way we get it. Doesn't mean you can't get it from touching something else. It just means that we don't need to be as concerned with that as we do with the respiratory droplets and that social distancing. That needs to be the main emphasis. But still clean things, still wash your hands, teach our children to do the same thing. But again, make sure we focus on the social distancing. That's priority number one. And then real quickly, a lot of headlines about this new study out of Columbia University that estimates 36,000 lives could have been saved had we started this social distancing just two weeks earlier than we did. That's, you know, a, roughly a third of all the deaths uh, that we've had in this country could have been reduced. How do they figure that out? How do they make that calculation? And Savannah, this is all based off of modeling, but this is interesting because back in February, I talked to a few experts and they said the same thing. They said that one of the disconcerting things was that we were a couple weeks behind in getting our response up and running and just two weeks would make a huge difference in what happens with cases. And that's exactly what this is showing doing using these mathematical models to figure it out. And so I think going forward, what this is telling us is as people are opening up and states are opening up, they need to make a big effort to see if there are any cases, if they are an even bigger bigger effort to clamp those cases down to make sure it doesn't turn into an outbreak, Savannah. All right, Dr. John Torres, lots to catch up with you on overnight. Thank you very much. Hold up to you. All right, now 710, President Trump heads to Michigan today to tour a Ford factory now making ventilators. The trip comes as he battles the state's governor on several fronts, even threatening to withhold federal funding over the issue of mail-in voting. NBC's Kristen Walker's at the White House with more on all this. Hey, Kristen, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. The coronavirus has had a devastating effect on Michigan, claiming more than 5,000 lives. So President Trump will travel to the hard-hit area today. In addition to touring that Ford plant you mentioned, he's going to meet with workers and local African-American leaders. It all comes as he is intensifying a battle with the state's Democratic governor. No, I think we're doing very well in Michigan. Very great place. President Trump headed to Michigan today, visiting a Ford plant that has been making ventilators in the fight against coronavirus. But it comes amid a bitter back and forth with the state. I tell you what, this nation can't be going down that path because it's a very dangerous path to go down. The president has threatened to withhold funding from the state if they attempt to expand mail-in voting amid the coronavirus pandemic, a method he has said is prone to fraud without citing any evidence. They'll be finding out very soon if it's necessary. I don't think it's going to be necessary because mail-in ballots are a very dangerous thing. They're, they're subject to massive fraud. But according to the Brennan Center for Justice, quote, mail ballot fraud is incredibly rare. Michigan's Democratic so governor, Gretchen Whitmer, has been a frequent of target of the president's attacks. Really she has no idea what's going on. And all she does is say, 
Oh, it's the federal government's fault. After she repeatedly criticized the federal government for a lack of planning and a slow response to the pandemic, the president even cheering on armed protesters earlier this month, demanding a rollback of stay-at-home orders, tweeting, liberate Michigan. Michigan's one of the reasons I ran. I was honored in Michigan long before I thought about I was honored as the man of the year in Michigan at a big event. As for that Ford plant visit today, the president, who has yet to be seen in public wearing a protective mask, was asked whether or not he will wear one during the tour, where they are required. I don't know. It's, I haven't even thought of it. It depends. I mean, you know, in certain areas I would, in certain areas I don't. But uh, I will certainly look at it. It depends on what situation. Am I standing right next to everybody or am I spread out? Now, as for the president's claim that he was Michigan's man of the year, while there's no record of that, it appears he may be referring to a large Republican Party dinner that he spoke at back in 2013. This will be the president's third trip to a battleground state in three weeks. Savannah? All right, Kristen Walker at the White House, thank you. And now this breaking news overnight, multiple people injured, a suspect in custody now. After a shooting at a mall in Glendale, Arizona, that mall had just recently reopened. NBC national correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us with this breaking news. Miguel, good morning. Savannah, good morning. This was just a terrifying incident as it was all unfolding. Hospital officials tell us one person is suffering critical condition, is suffering critical injuries. Two other people have non-life threatening injuries. Police believe the shooter may have actually recorded this incident. He is now in custody. Overnight panic during a pandemic after a lone gunman opened fire in a shopping area in Glendale, Arizona, about 15 miles from Phoenix. Just as the country takes steps to slowly reopen, police say shots rang out around 7.25 p.m. in the Westgate Entertainment District, a large complex of shops and restaurants. It was probably the scariest moment of my life. I dropped everything, told people, I was like, come on, like we have to go inside. Arizona State Senator Martin Cazada posting on Twitter that he was in the area at the time of the shooting, writing, I saw two victims with my own eyes. I saw the shooter. Once police arrived, the shooting had already ended. We were able to locate that suspect in the Westgate area. Our officers challenged that suspect and were able to safely take that person into custody. Authorities would not identify the suspect and say they do not have a motive or the type of weapon used, but say they believe he was the only one involved in the shooting. Officials now asking residents to shelter in place after the chaotic incident, just as many people are striving to get back to their normal lives. The shelter in place, again, is still in place, um, not because we believe that there is an active threat, but we need to systematically and efficiently check those businesses to ensure if we have any additional victims or witnesses. The state of Arizona, like so many other states, had just eased stay-at-home restrictions. Police say the shooting could have been so much worse. As for that alleged incident of the gunman who had recorded the incident, police say they are still reviewing that piece of evidence. Savannah? All right, I'll take that, Miguel. Thank you so much. And now to the other breaking news of the morning, that historic flooding emergency in Michigan. Officials are warning it could last for days, and an investigation has now been launched into the failures of two dams that forced 10,000 people to evacuate. NBC's Kathy Park is in Midland, Michigan. Hey, Kath, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. I am standing here in what would be a parking lot, but as you can see, it's been transformed into a lake. Fortunately, though, the water is slowly starting to recede, but officials say a lot of the roads in the area are still impassable, and it could be days before the area is back below the flood stage. This morning, parts of central Michigan are being pushed to the limit. Catastrophic flooding in the middle of an ongoing public health crisis. One river cresting at more than 35 feet, the highest it's been in more than three decades. That's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Days of heavy rain turn into a surge of rushing water. No match for two dams that ultimately failed Tuesday night. Down river, homes and cars completely submerged. Roads and bridges turned into rubble. Dow Chemical activating emergency plans at its sprawling plant on the banks of the Tittabawassee River in Midland. 
Governor Gretchen Whitmer declaring a state of emergency, ordering 10,000 residents in Midland to evacuate, despite the state's ongoing coronavirus stay-at-home measures. It's hard to believe that we're in the midst of a hundred year crisis, a global pandemic, and that we're also dealing with a flooding event that looks to be the worst in 500 years. Jeremy Hammond got out as the water began rising and is now trying to balance safety with social distancing in this school turned shelter. I'm gonna, you know, try and wash my hands and use hand sanitizer, but you know, I really have a high level of fear. Betty Pankey lived through the last major flood in 1986, but didn't lose her house. Now she's been forced out of her senior living center. The dining room and the kitchen are totally flooded. There are also questions this morning on whether this disaster could have been prevented. It sounds like the maintenance on the dams wasn't kept up as well as it should have been. In 2018, the National Inventory of Dams classified both the Edenville and Sanford dams as high hazards, meaning loss of human life would be likely if the dam failed. Federal regulators are now ordering an independent investigation. The flooding may have passed its peak, but the danger isn't over. We're looking probably at four to five days at least before the water recedes. And Boyce Hydro, the owner of the dams, issued a statement last night saying that their operators worked around the clock to lower the water levels ahead of the storm, but strong winds and heavy rain just became too overwhelming. Governor Whitmer said that the state will be pursuing legal action for anyone who may be responsible for this disaster. Hoda? All right, Kathy Park for us in Midland there. Uh, thank you, Kathy. It's now uh, 718. Let's go over to Savannah. We move to Washington now, where one of the White House's longest serving employees has died at the age of 91 after contracting the coronavirus. Wilson Roosevelt German served 11 presidents. He started as a cleaner in the Eisenhower administration, was promoted to Butler when John F. Kennedy was in office. He stayed on through the Obama administration. German was remembered fondly by former President George W. Bush and former First Lady Laura Bush in a statement to NBC News. They said he was a lovely man. He was the first person we saw in the morning when we left the residence and the last person we saw each night when we returned. What a career. Mm. Let us turn to Al for a moment, get a check of the forecast. Good morning to you. Good morning, guys. We've got sunshine here in the northeast, but big changes coming down to our friends down south. In fact, we are looking at 13 million people under flood watches and warnings. And in fact, as we put the radar into motion, you'll see we've got heavy rain now training up up from the Atlantic into the Appalachians and the mid-Atlantic states. Heavy rain today, risk of flash floods and landslides into this evening. Tomorrow, this low slowly moves to the north. A lot of swollen waterways from Ohio to Southern Cal uh, South Carolina, I should say. And then low pressure will develop offshore, lingering showers for the northeast. It's going to be a real mess. Look at the rainfall amounts. We are talking upwards of five inches of rain or more throughout parts of the Carolinas.